So what we're going to talk about today is uh, intentional leadership versus normal leadership, which is unintentional. And just to give you an example of uh, some of the intentional techniques, I wear a suit four times a year. Okay, I'm wearing one today intentionally to project power. And now I'm going to intentionally take the jacket off because we're going to get down to work. And I want you guys to understand we don't use a jacket when we get down to work. So I'm giving you signals. I'm intentionally giving you signals. As a matter of fact, I'm going to roll up my sleeves for two reasons. One, because we're really going to get down to some hard work, and I want you to have that signal. And I'm also wearing a watch, which I wear four times a year. I don't even know how it works, uh, but it projects power. Uh, so. There's a point to all of this, and what we're going to discuss in the next 40 minutes will be what that point is. But first I have uh, to ask a question to the crowd. Is there a difference between management and leadership? Does anybody have a suggestion of what that difference could be? Yes. That's a good one. Management is a title you're bestowed on. Leadership is not bestowed. It just means people are following you. But I'll give you another example. And if anybody here has children and have seen them grow, you'll probably understand this. Management is what we do with two-year-olds. It's having gates up so that they don't go down the stairs and fall down the stairs. It's putting them in play pens. It's having them in play groups that are closely supervised. That's management. When your child is 17 and has car keys and stays out till 12 o'clock, management fails. It doesn't scale. When your child says, my parents wouldn't be proud of me if I did this, when your child understands how to act and acts the way mostly they think you'd want them to act, that's because you've been a leader. Leadership scales. Leadership is what happens when your team is not with you in front of them. Leadership doesn't require hard and fast rules and manuals. Management does. So how do we lead and how do we do that intentionally? First, we need to understand how humans really work. Ha okay, show of hands. How many people here have been caught in traffic? Stuck in traffic. OK. Everybody, right? When most of us, when I'm in traffic, something starts happening. Or it actually used to happen until I realized this. And that is, I started to sweat. I started to get nervous. I might bang the horn. I might bang the dashboard. I'd get angry. I'd get agitated. And I wouldn't be nice to anybody else in the car. And what was happening to me is I was in fight or flight mode. Now, in the animal kingdom, the, the, the animals that are lower, supposedly, than us, that takes place when they're about to die. But we humans are sitting in traffic and acting like we're going to die. Now, I want to see another show of hands. Everybody raised their hand when, we had, were, when they said they were in traffic. Who has been in traffic? and died. Raise your hand. Okay, nobody. It's a good sign. Um, you are actually in less danger when you're sitting in your car and it's not moving than when you're sitting in your car and it's going 60 miles an hour. Yet, here you are going five miles an hour acting like you're going to die. All of us have these ingrained things that come from evolution that we have not shed. Although we believe we're rational individuals, rational human beings. So let's talk about rationality. If I offered you folks and said, I have a $5 bill, but I really need a $1 bill. Would any of you make that trade with me? Would you give me $1 for five, no tricks? Okay, good, that's math. 
It's good. It's a good utilitarian trade. So we got that one knocked off. But let's make that trade a little more difficult now. This is called the trolley problem. Here's a trolley going down a track. And if it goes uninterrupted, there are five people tied to the track who will die if the trolley proceeds. Yet, there's a hero, a possible hero who can save those people. It's one of you. You are sitting at a switch. And if you push that switch, you can make the trolley move to an off-siding track. Unfortunately, for another individual, somebody you don't know, you don't know any of these people, you don't know if they're good, you don't know if they're bad, you don't know if they're next savior of the world, you don't know anything about them, there's no tricks to this, but you, if you flip that switch, five people will live. Unfortunately, one person will die. Can I see a show of hands of how many people would flip the switch, please? Really, would you flip the switch? Typically, when you do this survey, somewhere between 65 to 80% of the people will flip that switch. Now, the utilitarian economics are exactly the same. It's lose one, save five as the other one, which 100%, now we've gone down to 80%. Want to see me take the same equation and flip the results? Now, we're on that track, same track, same trolley, same five people, except for we're not near a switch, we're on a bridge, we're on an overpass. And there is a person on that bridge who is big enough, an anonymous person, that if we push them off the bridge, they will stop the trolley. One person dies, five people are saved. Show of hands, don't be shy. Show of hands, how many people push that person off the bridge? Normally the numbers are within 20, 25%, okay? See how these numbers are going down? Yet the mathematics, I mean, you guys are engineers, you're testers, you're software, you look at software. This is, it's just an equation. How is this rational? Let's take it one more time. There are five people who are going to die. They're very sick. Each one needs a different organ or they will die. There's a perfectly healthy person who has every organ all five of those people need. Show of hands how many people will grab that person, strap him down, and harvest his organs to save those five people. Don't be shy. Come on. You're the only, I, th now I've had two people willing to do that, okay? The other guy was a, uh, a rock war veteran who was uh, special forces suffering a PSTD. P <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> so I'm gonna interview you later and see what you two have in common. It is the same math, right? There's something going on here that makes us move from saving five but giving up one to letting all five die. There's something going on, and I will uh, propose to you that that is evolution. We have three brains, basically three computing functions of the brain. They're very simple. The first one was developed 280 million years ago, and I'm going to sort of, I'm coming over here because this is 280 million years ago. The first one was 280 million years ago. That's the reptilian brain. It's very simple. It has very few inputs and outputs. It has no capacity for abstract thinking. It has no empathy. It has no morals. It's just a yes or no engine. In fact, it has no, it's binary. It's very much like you folks. It's binary, on or off. It has no gray in it. So that's why a frog will jump out of hot water if you put it in hot water, but sit in the hot water when it goes from warm, from cold to a little warmer, to a little warmer, to a little warmer, to boiling. Because 
it can't tell the difference in relative, small relative changes. When we put, hook our brains up to an MFRI, ultimately, that's a MRI that looks at what lights up, by the way, when our brain, what's electrically happening in our brain. When we hook our brains up to an MFRI, that's the part of the brain that actually ultimately makes the decision. There's other parts of the brain that's on the committee, on the board, but that's the decision maker. That's where we made that decision. Actually, it's not, but it's close to it. It's where we make those decisions on, will we push, will we hit, flip a switch, or will we give the guy $5, or take his $5. The next part of the brain, 200 million years ago, 280 million, 200 years ago, and that part of the brain is the mammalian brain. That's where our parental instincts come from. That's where our empathy comes from. That's where feelings come from. You all have feelings, right? I know there's more feelings in the other room, women who test, than here, but we all have feelings. By the way, I flew here I flew here, and it was a five and a half hour flight. I flew from Washington. If when I took off the basal ganglia complex, the reptilian brain was developed, that's when I took off. In that flight, 20 minutes before we landed, the flight attendant said, please put up your tables, put on your seat belts. If that was part of evolution, and we were using that five and a half flight to represent this 280 million year journey, I would not have understood her, because language, the ability to understand language, had not yet developed in the brain. That part of the flight would have happened right here, one minute before we landed. Because 200,000 years ago, the part of our brain that understands logic and abstract thinking, concepts, conceptual concepts, that's when that was developed. So the people who uh, would not push, first of all, the, the switch is an abstraction. It's not exactly murder. When you pull that switch, it's an abstraction. That's why more people are willing to do that because the part of the brain that doesn't understand abstractions doesn't see that as murder. Whereas when you push the person off the bridge, that's not an abstraction. You're actually murdering that person. And the reason you won't murder them, even though you'll save five people is, do you know what you call the last species that was willing, that only had, had one or two offspring a year and was willing to murder its own kind? Do you know what you call that species? Anybody? Extinct. <laughs> Extinct. If we were programmed, any species that was ever programmed that was willing to kill itself, eat its own, kill its own, is gone because they could not have survived. This is programming, illogical programming, that serves us as a species, but it's not part of our rational thinking. Does that make sense? And some of these things, these remnants from evolution, actually don't serve us very well. Does anybody have a 13-year-old, 15-year-old, 16-year-old child with a phone? <laughs> okay. So neurotransmitters that were used to help us behaviorally survive, like oxytocin, dopamines, we now get those from our phones. Those were originally programmed into us to survive so that we would work with a herd. We would feel accepted. We knew that community, because in community, we could beat the lion. But when we're on our own, we couldn't. And those neurotransmitters helped us survive, survival of the fittest. But now those neurotransmitters are actually being hijacked by likes. 
because a like makes me feel like I'm part of a community and I get addicted to it. So some of these remnants ser don't serve us well at all. Okay, and the next thing on uh, how illogical we are is we actually use different parts of our brain depending on how much energy we have, how we feel. Um, the brain is the most intensive, energy exhaustive organ in our brain, in our, in our bodies. It uses an amazing amount of energy. And because of that, we try to conserve energy with it. We don't use it to its full capacity all the time. And a study that illustrates that took place in Israel with Israeli parole judges. And in that study, it found that when an Israeli parole judge just starts working in the morning or comes back from their lunch break or even a bathroom break, if they have more energy, they approve 65% of the parole applications that are in front of them. Two hours later, it goes to zero. They approve 35% on average, but it goes to zero. So it's not how well you've acted or how much you deserve parole, it's where do you fall on the pile. So if your name starts with a Z, you're not getting parole. So, you, and you all have done this. Does any, it, let me give you the example of where we do things like this. When we're driving, okay, today, when we're driving, if we've driven for five years, have you ever been to like, oh, I'm a couple exits away from my exit? I have no idea how I got here. I don't remember passing exit three or four, but here's exit seven and I'm getting off at exit eight and you start paying attention. You started using that same part of the brain that approves 65%, the part of the brain that can concentrate and really start thinking about things, and stopped using the part of the brain that is just, am I in danger? Is there a car too close to me? The real ancient part of the brain. You, it's muscle memory driving now, and all you're looking for are the signals that say, I am gonna die. And then you wake up and bring up the other part of the brain. Now, when every one of us was driving, the first time behind the wheel, we didn't use that part of the brain. I guarantee you that when you started driving, if a car was coming in the other lane on a two-way highway, you were freaking out. You were saying, is it too close to me? You moved over to the right. Every parked car, you noticed it. You used the other part of the brain. You could not afford to conserve energy. And there's a reason why this is important. There's a reason why this is important to you as a leader, because we need to understand the people that we lead don't always use the most rational kind part of their brain. So the reason I wear a suit is I am not a prototypical leader, and we'll talk about why, but I'm not a prototypical leader, so I have to game it. I have to be something, I have to be inauthentic in the beginning to give people the feeling that I can lead. And then I can earn my stripes that I really can lead. But I have to sort of game and appear as if I can be a leader because people don't say, what's this guy's background? Where did he come from? How many successes? They just look at me and make a snap decision. They use that back part of the brain. He sure as heck doesn't look like Ronald Reagan. Is it logical that five, only five of the last 45 presidents were shorter than average? Are only tall people great leaders? Are only men great leaders? Why is it, how do we choose our leaders? Do we choose them based on them having their sleeves rolled up and not wearing watches? We look for leaders the same way we look for leaders 10,000 years ago like they were gonna lead us in war 10,000 years ago. And so short people 
are on a, uh, are, are where we have a deficit. We don't get picked as often. Women have to fight and be bigger because that is not how we choose our leaders. We choose our leaders based on will they beat the hell out of the other tribal leader with a club? That's that part of the brain, not this part of the brain. And that's why we need to be big. We need to show up strong. Um, wh whether you voted for Trump or Hillary, in terms of modeling behavior of who would be the greatest warrior, Hillary displayed traits that might have made her a great leader, but didn't make people feel safe. She was deliberative. She was thoughtful. She wouldn't take quick action. By the time the other tribe picked up the club and was swinging at her, she would think of a good debate point. She was perfectly qualified to push the button for the nuclear codes, but that part of the brain didn't think so. The alternative was somebody who was bold and big and brash and made that part of the brain feel safe. So what we're going to work on today is first a construct of if we could make this leadership, how we choose leaders, if we could put it into an abstraction, what would that abstraction look like? How would we model it? And then what we're going to work on is how can I make a checklist so that I appear as a leader all the time and I don't take demerit points every day that make me less of a leader, not look like a leader? So if we, if we built a magic quadrant, a Gartner magic quadrant, you guys all, when you're looking at software tools, you know that magic quadrant thing you use to set up, you want somebody in the top right. If we built a magic quadrant for leadership, our vertical axis would be competence. Not necessarily even subject matter expertise, but that's important, but are they a leader? Are they intelligent? We'd look at, is this a competent actor? And on the horizontal, we would look at their character. Do they do what they say? Are they evil? Will they stab me in the back? And that builds our magic quadrant. Now, if I'm looking for a babysitter, I want them to be high character or someone to house sit. That's a better example. I want them to be very high character, right? I only have to know how to use a key, a light switch, call the police. I don't need much competence. But, and when we flew here today, I didn't need a pilot who doesn't cheat on his taxes. I could have a pilot who's here. I just wanted him to be up top right. But for the leader, the person who leads my tribe, my organization, my enterprise, I need them to be top and to the right. And then there's one more factor that factors in to trusting and being able to lead people for a long time and engender trust. And that is their intentions. Do we match our intentions? So if you remember about five years ago, the San Francisco 49ers played the Baltimore Ravens in a football match, in a Super Bowl. And in terms of leadership, those two coaches were top of their game. They had led their teams to the best records. They had made the Super Bowl. They were top right as leaders. And they were brothers. Should they trust each other? No. Matter of fact, they should trust each other less because their intentions were totally misaligned. Their intentions were, 
I'm going to beat you. You wouldn't share your game plan with a guy whose mission is to beat you. So our intentions of, uh, as leaders are very important. We must understand what our intentions are. We must announce our intentions, and we must be true to our intentions. So the whole rest of this presentation is going to be how do we build a checklist that helps us model that behavior and be consistent that shows high competence, high character, and aligned intentions. And everybody's checklist will be different. But my theory is, and what I'd ask you to do is make one and be true to yours. Be intentional about it. Because even as leaders, we go back to this part of the brain. And we stop doing things that we know are right. Why do pilots have checklists? They've taken off on their airplanes a thousand times that year. They've landed a thousand times that year. Why do they go through these stupid checklists? And if anybody understands the concept of how we learn, when we're learning something new, how to drive or how to fly a plane, before we've ever done it, most of us who are in touch with ourselves are conscious that we're incompetent at flying or driving. We're consciously incompetent. And as we take training and practice, we become consciously competent. That's the part where we stay engaged and we're always conscious. And when we, become, when we achieve mastery, we become unconsciously competent, which is dangerous. Because when we're flying into Miami, which is a nice, straight flight path over the, over the Everglades, and we forget to put our flaps down, we might be able to still land the plane and pull it off. But when you're flying into Reagan National Airport, which is like landing on an aircraft carrier, that thing that just dropped out of our repertoire, because once we pulled it off, we may not do it the second time. So we start becoming unconsciously incompetent. And so that's why we need checklists. And that's why we need to, if you want to be a leadership leader and you don't want to betray yourself as a leader, that's why you need a checklist. And that's why you need to check in to yourself and say, how am I doing? Because it's just like flying a plane. You need to make sure your flaps are down. So to study leadership, let's start with the question of who are some great leaders, okay? And I need participants. Remember, I'm Mr. Cranky and I'm Mr. Cranky for a reason. So I need volunteers or I'll come out in the audience and pick volunteers. And this is all being taped and I'm gonna send it to your families. <laughs> yes. A, a Blinken, good one. Another, great leaders, yes. Genghis Khan, yes, a great leader. Actually, a, he has a bad rap, if you've read about him, yes. Nelson Mandela. Steve Jobs, good. Peyton Manning, an Indianapolis fan, or Denver. I'm sorry? Oh, Colin Powell, great leader, yeah. Uh, and and I'll, these are great names they are going to make this, when we, we're going to use these when we're looking at attributes that made them great. That's another hand. Mahatma Gandhi. Mark Cuban. How about some women, aren't there? How about Angela Merkel? She's the leader of the free world. <laughs> you know, there are women great leaders. We need to recognize them. Cheryl Sandberg, good one, yeah. <laughs> Catherine the Great, just been to the Hermitage. What a great castle she had. There are, there are great leaders. These are great leaders. What made them great? Let's look at that, and that's how we'll make our checklist, right? We'll, we'll reverse engineer. You guys do that in software all the time. We're just going to reverse engineer it.
Mahatma Gandhi, what was some of the traits that made him a great leader? Empathy, selflessness, integrity. These are great. So how he led, he led by example, he set a clear, he modeled the right behavior. How about Colin Powell? He had the courage to say what was not necessarily politically expedient, to not take the, the easy path. Sheryl Sandberg, what's a trait that Sheryl Sandberg has? Empathy. Has anybody seen the video when she talks at a, um, she, she speaks at a, uh, un, at, yeah, at, at, at a uh, university graduation and talks about the death of her husband? She's strong. She's strong and she is believable. Strength. So here's what I'd ask you to do. Think about who you are authentically and pick five traits. And you're gonna, that's the beginning of your checklist for leadership. Now, what I do is if you came into my bathroom on my mirror, when I brush my teeth in the morning and brush my teeth at night, I have a little yellow stickum. And I go through my flight path check-in. I say, what did I do today that enhanced or detracted from the five leadership traits that I want to portray to my team? It's a checklist. It's intentional. It's because I don't want any of those traits to drop out of my repertoire. And I want to learn from the acts where I do that. I don't want to become unconsciously incompetent. And that when we talk about intentions, for instance, has, does, you know, when, when 250,000 people showed up on the National Mall in August of 2003 in 98 degree humidity and humid weather to see Martin Luther King, none of them showed up to hear the speech. They all showed up because they agreed with his why. They agreed with his intentions. They believed in what he believed, and they wanted to be there because of that. Think about it. There was no internet then. Yet 250,000 people from all over the country showed up on the mall that day. It was inconvenient, but it was because they were aligned on the same why. There's a great TED Talk video that should help you develop your why, your team's why. Why, and if anybody's ever heard, read the book Drive by Daniel Pink, which talks about the three main motivators, his version of why is higher purpose, which is a higher purpose is a huge motivator for team. It out motivates money for team performance. Why? higher purpose, that is, that defines your intentions. So again, on your leadership canvas, and I will offer a leadership canvas to anybody, you need to be intentional about your why and you need to declare your why. This is why we're here. So if you're leading a team of developers um, that work for a company like Pulte, which is a great company, has a great corporate culture, uh, the reason we're here is Pulte is building homes for families. And what we do is ensuring in the quality of our software that those homes are structurally sound, that these people are well financed, that we are ensuring that those homes, that we are building homes at the best price for families. That's a higher purpose than we're making profit for the corporation. That's why we need to make this right because there are families who depend on us. That's our why if we're Pulte.
What's your why? And then every organization has a culture. And, and I, at one of my tables we were discussing culture and I, I found it interesting because sometimes we try to muddle our culture with too many things. So let's look at great organizations and let's think about some of the great cultural traits. Nordstrom's. Does anybody know a great cultural trait that all people who work at Nordstrom's in body service customers always right I don't know if it's true I don't know if it's a myth but somebody returned tires to a Nordstrom and they took them back <laughs> I do know that somebody returned a stained ripped prom dress saying they never wore it and they took it back it's customer service that's why people go there how about some other companies that have great cultures what, and what is a great cultural trait of Southwest? Lead with love. And do those people have fun? This is a fun place to work, and it's a fun place to ride. I'm one of the worst things that humans can do, which is get in a flying bus. They try to make it fun. Okay, so what I say is, you must define five cultural traits. Five and um, put those in your canvas. Now, one of the people I coached came up with my favorite. He was complaining and firing people because they always said no, everything was negative. And so when he went back and developed a culture with his team, what he did was he inserted, we are a yes if culture. Yes, I can get that done if you give me 10 more people. Yes, I can get that done if you give me 100,000 more dollars. There are no no's here. Figure out the problem and tell me what would make that a yes. And that's part of his culture. You can only have, on cultural traits, on personal leadership traits, no more than five. It gets muddled. The next thing that every organization should understand is what is our value discipline? What makes us better than people who directly compete with, compete with us or different? And so, let's go back to Nordstrom. I can buy sunglasses from three different companies that, that we'll talk about today that all, and the reason I buy it from one versus the other is very different. So, the reason I would buy from Amazon is they are product leaders. When I say they're product leaders, I don't have to leave my home, I can easily find them. There's a thousand different sunglasses, and now I can get those sunglasses delivered to my home for free 15 minutes after I thought about ordering them. They get there really fast. That's product leadership, that's why I'll buy it. I'm not as concerned about price. I don't want to try them on. Then there's operational efficiency. I can walk into a Walmart and know that that same sunglass will be there, it'll be priced right, checkout won't be bad, there'll be somebody my age who will say, hello, welcome to the Walmart, there'll be a greeter there. They're operationally efficient, they'll be on the shelf. And then lastly, I can go buy them at Nordstrom's, because when I break them two years from now, they'll take them back. When I walk into the store, they'll say, hello, Mr. Hellman, welcome back. So they have all decided, you have, to be, you have to compete on one of these. You need to pick which one is the one that I will hang my hat on. You need to be good in all three. You can't be bad in any of those value disciplines, but you need to be good in all three. And you need to be intentional. Your team needs to know which one we value. And lastly, and not as important for you guys, is what's our end game? So, um, it, when I had a software team, for instance, we needed to develop a software for a client by a certain time. And we, that was the end game. We needed to get it done, we needed to get it done in this time, we had this. And everybody knew that if we got that customer, what it would mean to the team. That was our end game. But you have to define these end games, these BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious goals that take a long period of time. 
and everybody needs to know what they are. And the key is that when we develop these things and have all these tools and everybody understands them and we put them into a canvas, so we need to declare them, some we need to model, some we need to declare, they're in your books, don't try to read it. <laughs> um, there, um, we need to declare who we are, what we stand for, why we're here. And we as leaders need to check in how have we modeled that behavior? Have we declared that behavior? Because when you do this, it's like having a 17-year-old with keys who knows that they're drunk and they need to call Uber and not get in the car. When you do this, you don't need to be there to manage your team because you're leading them. They understand what you would do and what you would want them to do if you're not there. And leadership scales. So if you have an intentional plan, your team understands who you are and you can lead. At the end of every day, you have to ask yourself three questions. Was I true to that canvas? Easy. Thank you. <laughs>